All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online, and uh, we're going to dive into our first session of the Indwelling Life class, Created to Abide. This is uh, session one, Created to Abide, and I just, uh, I believe the Lord's going to hopefully anoint this. I, I, I love this session because it helps us understand how to live the abiding life. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, I'm going to read a quote from Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, you guys probably heard, have heard of Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill, but just an incredibly powerful man of God who has gone on to be the, with the Lord many, many years ago. But he said, we've got people who've been saved for 30 years, and they're not a day older in the spiritual life. They're no more mature. They're no more spiritual strength or spiritual understanding or spiritual revelation. Why? Because they have lived on meetings instead of living on Christ. Now, if I, he wrote that, I don't know when he wrote that, but many years ago, probably before the Internet was really something that it is, I would change this word, lived on meetings, to lived on YouTube, to lived on podcasts, to live on books, because a lot of the church now it doesn't go to meetings like, like they used to. We live on podcasts, we live on YouTube, but the point is, is we've lived on teachings about Christ or exhortations about Christ rather than living on Christ himself. And, and I, I just have seen, if, if we live on another person's revelation, then we're never going to grow up into spiritual maturity. We've got to live on the revelation of Jesus Christ in our own relationship with him. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It's uh, the what many scholars refer to as the abiding life passage. And it's one of the most incredible teachings I think Jesus taught on. He was preparing his disciples for what life would be like without him. And when he went away, in fact, Jesus said, we'll look at this, I think, in the next session. When, when Jesus went away, he said to his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. That, that is a, an incredibly remarkable statement. It is more advantageous to, advantageous to you that I go away because if I don't go away, I will not send the Spirit. But if I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will be with you and he will be in you. Now, in John chapter 15, the Lord gives us, I believe, the pattern or the blueprint or the how-to of how we are to live from the indwelling life of Christ and the vision that Jesus has for us as his people. So I'm sure you're familiar with John chapter 15, but I want to read this. I want us to start out reading this just to lay the groundwork for what we're going to, this class, so much of this class is built upon John chapter 15, the abiding life. We're going to have about three or four sessions about the abiding life starting today. And so I just want to start reading this and just read along with me, but just hear the words of the Lord as if he were speaking directly to you because he was. The Lord says to you, just even receive it as a prophecy. The Lord says to you, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that, he, that bears fruit, he prunes it, he cuts it down, he cuts it back so that it may bear more fruit. God has a plan for you to bear more fruit. Uh, verse 3, you are already clean, or it actually means you are already pruned because of the word that I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. And I want us to capture right there that one little small phrase, I in you. Because the abiding life hinges upon I in you. Everything we're going to talk about is made possible because the indwelling Holy Spirit is now in you. Everything that Jesus here is going to describe is now um, you're able to live this because of the I in you reality. We talked about that last Sunday, that Christ in you, the hope of glory, that Christ in you is the hope of glory, that what was hidden from most of the prophets and the patriarchs and even the angels, the, the stunning revelation that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, now dwells in you. That's what the Lord's saying right here in, in this verse. Abide in me. I would even phrase it like this. 
Abide in me because I am in you. Now, I know that's not what the translation says, but I believe that's what the heart of this is saying is, Abide in me, abide in me because I am in you. Because I am in you, you can abide in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. In other words, if you are not connected to Christ, I would rephrase it like this, is your spirit is always connected to Christ, but if there are things ob obstructing the life of God in you from being released, then you cannot bear fruit. But you've got to remove those things that obstruct, those hindrances. We'll deal with that in an entire session. But unless you abide in him, unless you remain in him, that you cannot bear fruit. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, again, that the emphasis there of Christ in you, which makes the abiding life possible, he bears much fruit. God has destined you to bear much fruit for him. God has saved you to bear much fruit for him. That doesn't mean living for God. That means Christ in you living and now him living in you now produces the fruit of Christ in you and through you. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Those things of Christ in you, you can bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. That doesn't mean we can't do anything, because we can do many things for God in the power of the soul, but we can not do anything worthwhile to the Father or to the Son unless we abide in Him. It is Christ from the beginning to the very end. It is Christ in you, Christ through you. It is Christ from the beginning to the end that matters to the Father. Nothing we do for God in the power of the soul and in the flesh matters anything to God. The flesh cannot please God no matter how much you do for Him. And so the Lord's really hitting on this is that apart from me, apart from that abiding life relationship of Christ in you living rather than yourself, you can do nothing of value for God. The flesh cannot please God. What you do for God in the power of the soul, in the mind, the will, and the emotions will never please God. Only Jesus Christ pleases God. And only what God has produced in you that's of Christ and that is done through you that's of Christ has any value to God. And so the Lord says, Abide in me and I in you, for apart from me you can do nothing. It is not by power, it is not by might, it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What we are talking about, living by the indwelling life of Christ, and all that God wants to do is completely from the beginning to the end, wholly and totally by the Spirit of God or it's nothing. This, I just want you to drill this into us. No matter how good you are, no matter how nice you are, no matter how kind you are, anything of the soul that you try to do for God means nothing to Him. It's by the Holy Spirit and Him alone. Just if we could just get that into us, that that living for God and the power of the soul and the power of the mind, the will and the emotions and what we do with our own flesh means nothing to God. God wants to crucify your flesh, even the good part of your flesh. There's two sides to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's the evil side and the good side. The evil side, we're pretty familiar with that, but the good side gets into the church and we want to do good things for God and the Lord's like, no, you can't do good things for me. It is by the Spirit from the beginning to the end. Yes. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse, verse 9, or no, verse 6, sorry. The reading is, need the reading glasses. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and he dries up. And they gather them, they cast them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you want to see a transformation in your prayer life, it comes not by asking God consistently to do something. 
though there is a place for persevering prayer, it comes out of intimacy with him. Remember Mary, remember Martha was doing many things for God and, and she said, Lord, would you heal my brother who's dead or would you raise him from the dead? And the Lord gave her a theological description about the resurrection. But Mary, who was intimate with the Lord, actually received a resurrection. See, when you're intimate with the Lord, your prayer life goes to an entirely different level. The Lord is saying that if you abide in me and I in you, your prayer life will go to a place that you've never dreamed possible where you don't have to just lay. I'm, I'm not saying we don't have to labor because there's things we have to labor for. But I'm saying prayer becomes so much more easy when we're praying out of a relationship with the Lord, out of an intimacy with the Lord, instead of praying transactionally, coming to God to get him to do stuff for us all the time, when we're praying out of an intimacy, we're praying out of an abiding, we're praying out of our connection with Jesus Christ. The Lord says here that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. My Father is glorified by this. Do you want to bring glory to the Father? Here's what he says. My Father is glorified by this, not that you go out and do a bunch of things for God. My, fa my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. The Lord wants you to bear much fruit. The Lord wants his life like the sap moving from the vine to the branch to flow through you to produce the fruit of Jesus Christ in you and through you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. So as we get into talking about the abiding life and what it means to live the abiding life, I bet if I asked you to raise your hand, if you ever heard of John 15, 1 through 11 and the abiding life, every person most likely would raise their hand, yes. We have, if you've been in the church for a while, you understand, okay, the abiding life is something that is taught on all, so often, okay? Abide, just, you just need to abide more. You just need to abide in Christ more. And, you know, I don't think any of us think like, okay, I've never heard this before. What does this mean? I think most of us have probably, yeah, we've heard John 15, 1 through 11, the abiding life, what it means. But what I've found is that not a lot of us know how to live the abiding life. Okay, how do you actually do it? You know what I mean? I mean, we know, okay, okay, yeah, we know that we need to live the abiding life. We've been taught that, you know, the moment we were saved, most likely we heard, okay, you need to live the abiding life. As a vine, a branch, fruits produced. We know all that. That's not new revelation to us. But what we probably don't understand is actually how to do it. How do you actually do it? And, and that was what I was asking. You know, for, for so I've been, a, a, I've been following the Lord wholeheartedly since the mid-90s. And, you know, I've heard so many messages about the abiding life and read books about the abiding life. But I was like, okay, how do you actually do it? I don't think I heard hardly any sermons at all about or read any books about how practically do you live the abiding life? I mean, am I supposed to connect with Jesus who is in heaven? Is that what he's saying to do? Uh, you know, what does this word abide even mean? We don't really use this word in the 21st century. Uh, you know, does it mean I need to pray more? Does it basically just a synonym for pray more, read the Bible more, fast more, and do what God tells you to do, obedience? You know, does, it, does that what it means? Um, how do you actually, what are the steps to live the abiding life? And so those are questions I was, I was really asking the Lord, okay, how do I do this? Does it mean I just kick back, you know, enter into the rest of God, cease striving, know that he's God, and not do anything? Or, you know, how do I do, what do I do? That was my question, and I just went on a journey, and that's probably why this class is here. I went on a journey, okay, Lord, how do you do this? And for me, the game changer, the game changer that really brought everything into clarity was this this understanding of the way the Lord created me. See, you are a branch, but for me, the Lord created you to abide in him. 
Understanding how he designed you enables you to abide in him. If you don't understand the way God created you, living the abiding life is really hard, okay? Because you're trying to relate to God in heaven, or you're not really sure how do you commune with God who lives inside of you. You don't really understand the dynamics of all this going on with your body, your soul, and things like that. So for me, the game changer was understanding the Lord created you with a goal, with a purpose for you to live the abiding life. And when you understand how God designed you for that purpose, living the abiding life becomes so much easier. The mystery that surrounds it, the like, you know, the confusion that surrounds it, it goes away when you understand how God created you. So that's really what this session is going to be about is, is God the Holy Spirit See, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul said that we are spirit, soul, and body. We're going to read that in a minute, but we're spirit, soul, and body. God, the Holy Spirit, you know, we tell kids when they get saved, just ask Jesus into your heart. Well, the Lord doesn't actually dwell in your heart automatically, even as a born-again Christian. He dwells in your spirit, and your heart and your spirit are different. And if you don't understand these distinctions... You know, it can create confusion. I don't mean you, you try to tell a five-year-old kid, no, he doesn't actually dwell in your heart. He dwells in your spirit. That's going to create confusion. So, you know, even with Anna, when she accepted the Lord when she was five, we said, okay, ask Jesus into your heart. But, you know, but, but the Lord does not dwell in your heart automatically. Even as a born-again Christian, he dwells in your spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one spirit. They are one spirit. You are one spirit. You are grafted to, catch this, you are grafted to the very same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's, that's incredible. The very same spirit. Paul was talking about this to the Romans. He's like, the very same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of God that created the universe at the words of Jesus Christ, that Spirit, the Spirit who impregnated the Virgin Mary, that Spirit, Him, the Holy Spirit, is now one Spirit with you. You are now one Spirit with the Holy Spirit. That is amazing. And so... This is what John said in 1 John, 14, 1 John 4, 13 to his audience. He was talking about the abiding life. He said, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit is the one that makes the abiding life possible. We're not trying to connect with Jesus in heaven so much as we're trying to connect with Christ inwardly and connecting with Christ inwardly makes us connected to Christ Jesus in heaven. And so when I talk about living by Christ's life, you know, just, just to give some clarity, what do I mean by living by Christ's life? What do I mean by that? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 where Paul talks about, I believe, I believe Galatians 2.20 is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. I, I say that about, about 100 different verses, but this is one of those 100 to 200 to 300, 500, 1,000 verses that are of utmost importance. But Paul said, this is what it means, we're answering the question, okay, how do I live, or what, what do I mean by living by Christ's life? Is Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, we're going to talk about this in a later session, but that does not mean, that, that was not meaning, what, what Paul was meaning there was, I was included, when Jesus died on the cross, I was included in his death. I was included in the historic death of Jesus Christ. Now, that historic death of Jesus Christ in which you were included, when you're born again, you now are included into his death and into his resurrection that happened 2,000 years ago. But that historic position that you have in Jesus Christ is not meant to be just a position. It's meant to be something you experience every day. And so Paul was saying 
here, I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ died, I died. When Christ died, you know, for Paul it was, you know, a couple decades before. When Christ died, or however many years, I didn't do the calculation, maybe a decade, I can't even do the calculations in my head. But when Christ died, I died with him. But for Paul, it wasn't just a positional death that he had. That the, the Holy Spirit began to work within Paul, and the Holy Spirit began to make the death that was real about Paul because of his, his inclusion in the death of Jesus Christ, he began to make that real by experience. So that when Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, it wasn't for Paul only a position. See, most of the church in the Western world especially our crucifixion with Christ is more of a position than it is an experience. And it's not meant to be just a position. It's meant to be an experience. It's meant to be a reality. It's meant to be real on the inside of you. I have been crucified with Christ. And here's what Paul said. It's no longer I who live. See, and we're going to talk about this in, in this session and also in later sessions, but in your soul you have what the scriptures refer to as suke or soul life. You have soul life, self life. It's the part of you that wants to get what you want, when you want it, and how you want it done. That's the soul life. That's the, or, or that's the self life. You know, I want what I want when I want it. You know, all of us know about that. That part of you has to die a thousand deaths by the cross of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying here, that self-life in my soul is no longer living. I am no longer living. Self in me is no longer living. Self is no longer getting what I want when I want it and how I want it done. That self has not only been positionally crucified with Jesus Christ, but that self has been experientially crucified with Christ. So the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of me has put to death that self-life in me. And so now the life source that I live by is not self-life in the soul. It's the life of Jesus Christ. But Christ lives in me. Christ in him who is life is the one who's living in Paul rather than himself. That makes sense? The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So that's what it means to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about all about this as we get deeper and deeper in this class. This is, again, this is, a, this is session one. We're going to have 19 sessions. So we're going to go deep. We're going to go really, really deep into this. I think it's going to really, if you really give your whole heart to this, I think your life will be transformed. So going back to John 15, as, as Jesus said to the apostles, he said, you are the branches. And so he would also say to us, you are are the branches. We are the branches. The branches don't have life in themselves. The branches don't produce fruit by themselves. The branches produce fruit by the sap of God's life flowing in you and through you. And so if you really want to live the abiding life, then understanding your role as a branch, understanding how God created you, spirit, soul, body, and I would also say heart, understanding that is so, so important because you're the branch, and understanding the way God designed you as a branch is vital to living by the indwelling life of Christ. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. We want to look at what Paul uh, communicated about the divine design that God had for humanity, what, the way God, he created us. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul said, Now may the God of peace himself, sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul revealed here not only how God created you, but Paul revealed here, here the order of how you should live. Spirit first, soul second, and body third. Spirit first, soul second, and body third. There is divine order in how you are meant to live. Most Christians live a soulish, carnal life. They have Christ in them, yes, but they haven't been trained how to live from their spirit 
So even in with a good heart that wants to serve God, they tried to live for, for God in the power of the soul, in the power of their mind, the will, and their emotions. They try to live for God out of their body. They, they, and so there is a divine order. If we're going to live by the Spirit of God, there is divine order in this. Spirit first, soul second, body third. And until we get that divine order correct in us, we're going to live a soulish, carnal life. We're not going to live a spiritual life. In fact, if you want to know, if you feel like your life is a mess, if you feel like you're going in circles and never making progress in the Lord, most likely it's because you're not living from your spirit first. You're most likely living from your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're most likely living from your body. You're most likely living from something other than the spirit. So if you feel like, okay, my life is in a mess, or I keep getting overcome by this and by that, and I keep going in a pattern over and over and over, most likely it's because you're, you haven't learned how to live from God's divine order of spirit first, soul second, body third. And until you get into divine order, you'll, we, we will never be able to overcome and bear the fruit God wants us to bear. So learning how to live from the spirit, by the Holy Spirit, is, is what helps us to uh, live the overcoming life. See, God designed your spirit to be the leader. God designed your spirit to be the leader. And I keep pointing here, I'm not talking to my gut, okay? Which Anna says keeps growing bigger and bigger every day. So I'm not talking about my gut. I'm talking about my innermost man, my spirit, okay? My spirit is meant to be the leader. My heart, my soul, is meant to be the recipient of the Spirit's, the Spirit's input. The soul is meant to receive the spiritual thoughts that come from the Holy Spirit that the soul then processes, that would be your mind, reasoning, expresses, that would be your emotions, and executes, that would be your will, the input that it receives from your spirit. And then your body is meant to be the servant of your soul, carrying out whatever the soul says to, for it to do. So your body is a servant. Your soul is the recipient of the spirit's input. And your spirit is the leader governing your soul and your body. All right? So if any of that gets out of divine order then we are going to be out of divine order. We're going, to be, we're going to be either soulish or carnal rather than spiritual. And so getting that divine order is of utmost importance. And so when you understand the way God created you, it makes living the abiding life so much easier. See, when you understand the way God created you, it makes living the abiding life so much easier. Now, Quentin, go ahead and show that diagram. It's a diagram we're going to just, just hopefully go over, you know, in this session definitely, but even in, in so many sessions, you want to make sure you understand this diagram is the, the different circles here. The outermost part of you is your body. All of us are familiar with our body. I mean, even a two-year-old, you know, he gets hurt and screams, okay, he's very familiar with our body. We look in the mirror, we see our body. We, we don't need a teaching about our body, but the body is the outermost part of who you are, and within the body is the soul. The soul is, the, is that when you die and you go out of your body, it is your soul that is going to go into eternity. Your soul is a spiritual part of you. It's immortal, but your soul is what's going to enter into eternity, whether in heaven or hell, based on whether you're born again. And your soul then, inside of your soul, is your heart, the heart, and we're going to get into what the heart is, because the heart is the innermost part of your soul, the deepest part of your soul, the deepest desires, the beliefs, the intentions, the motives. And within your heart is the spirit that has been born again. And so within your spirit dwells the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is now connected to your human spirit as one, fastened to your human spirit as one. And so the goal is... Is, is as you to live by the indwelling life of Christ, is you want your spirit, that innermost part of you, to be the strongest part of your being. You want your spirit to be the strongest part of your being, and you want your spirit to be the spirit of Christ in your spirit to overflow into your heart, 
And then for your heart, just like your physical heart pumps blood throughout your body, just as that, you want your, your invisible heart, that, that, that spiritual heart, not the physical heart, you want that heart to have Christ dwelling there and then to pump his life outward into your thoughts, your emotions, and your choices. And then your body then serves that. So we're going to go into each component here right now. So your spirit. So, you know, most people, you know, just teaching Christians for a long time, most Christians, you know, most of us, we know we have a body. I just said that. We know we have a body. We've experienced pain. We look in the mirror. All of us know we have a body. Most of us know we have a soul. We experience joy and sadness, anger, anxiety. We experience all the emotions and feelings and thinkings of the soul. But the spirit is not easy to discern. Because the spirit is the innermost part of you, most Christians never really think about their spirit. Most Christians think, yes, I have mental understanding of my spirit. I know the scriptures say you have a spirit, but I don't really think about my spirit. I don't really think about my spirit and how to live from my spirit and, and the functions of my spirit. I don't really think about that. I'm more living in the soul. I'm more living in the thinking, processing of the mind, will, and the emotions, and the body, what, what the five senses want. I'm more living that. And so the spirit is not easy to discern. And when the spirit is not easy to discern and we don't experience that, then what happens is naturally by default, the soul and the body take over and the carnal life begins, the life of living in the flesh. And so if we want to be people who live from the spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit, we've got to learn what the, the scriptures talk about our spirit. So your spirit is the most vital component of God's divine design because your spirit is a place where God dwells. Your spirit is a place where you commune and fellowship with God. You don't commune and fellowship with God in your mind. You commune and fellowship with God in your spirit. Spirit to spirit communion with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Thought transference of the indwelling spirit transferring his thoughts to your spirit. You and your spirit knowing things immediately by your intuition. Well, apart from conscious reasoning or outside influence, you just know, I'm sure you've experienced this, you just know something in your spirit that you know is true, you know is from God. That is your intuition communing with the Lord. And so your spirit is that place where you commune and fellowship with him. It's a place where you, your soul and body. So what happens is, for a lot of Christians, is they don't have the revelation from the Lord of their, of their human spirit. And so what Christianity has now become is has become a soulish rat race, so to speak, of so many people trying to accumulate knowledge, so many people trying to you know, learn the scriptures, which I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm 100% in four of learning the scriptures, but getting the, the scriptures into their mental component, into their mind. And there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. There's a place for that. But so many Christians are living by intelligence, knowledge, rather than from the spirit of God. The Lord said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them are life, but you will not come to me that you may have life. Now, again, I, you, you know me. I am a Bible through and through. The scriptures are of utmost importance. What I'm getting at is you cannot understand the scriptures by your brain alone, by your mind alone. It takes the spirit of God in you to reveal the word of God. And so, yes, the mind is important to study and analyze and process and cross-reference different scriptures, but until the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, until Christ in you dwells in you, gives you revelation of what this is talking about, you will live by the intelligence or the knowledge that that verse gives you, and you will live by default in the soul. That's what most of the church is doing today. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, most of the church is living by getting the knowledge of the Bible and then trying to take that knowledge, process it, and then in the soul, obey it. Okay? That's better than disobeying it, by all means, but God has a better plan that we, we don't live from the brain, we don't live from the mind, we live from the Spirit of God who gives us His thoughts, His ideas, 
his revelation, and then the, the Spirit of God communicates that to, the, to our minds, and then we do it from the inside out, from the innermost part of us. And so, obviously, your, your mind is important, but the, the mind was never meant to be the leader. The Spirit was meant to be the leader, and your mind was meant to serve your spirit. Now, how you work that out, you know, we'll get into that more and more. But here's my point. If we are going to live by the indwelling life of Christ, we need a revelation of our human spirit. We need God to come like an x-ray machine or an MRI and show us what the visible eye can't see. We need to get into the scriptures to see what does the scriptures say about our human spirit. We need a revelation of our human spirit because if we can't identify that part of us where God dwells, our human spirit, we're going to inevitably live in the soul by the power of the soul, by the power of the mind, the will, and the emotions, living for God rather than living from God. We're going to live from the body and what we want, what the five senses want. So we need that revelation for God to give us an eye-opening, heart-illuminating revelation that shows us this part of you, this part of you is where I dwell. The innermost man, Jesus called the spirit, the innermost man. It's that place so deep inside of you where he dwells. How we need a revelation of that innermost man, what, who the Lord said, the innermost man, or what Paul said, the inner man. Because if you don't have a revelation of your human spirit, you are going to struggle living the Christian life. You are going to struggle living the Christian life. You are going to keep spinning your wheels and going nowhere. You're going to keep going around in circles, never making any progress because the soul will get burned out. The soul was never meant to live for God. Jesus said, come to me and find rest for your soul. Find rest from the soul living. Find rest from you living, trying to live this Christian life. Living the Christian life the standard God's called us to is impossible for you to live. Only Christ can live it, and only Christ in you can live it. Only Christ in you living can live it. And if you try to live this life by the soul, you will experience burnout. And that's why the Lord said, come to me, find rest for your soul. Let me live rather than you. So if you are struggling, it might be because you lack revelation of your human spirit. Man, if that is the case for you, I would highly recommend that you go to the Lord and just cry out to the Lord, show me, teach me about my human spirit. It is the most important part of you. And yet most Christians neglect it or are completely unaware of their human spirit. I just encourage you, get a revelation of your, of, your, of your spirit. With your spirit, and the notes, the notes in the book also will have those scripture references, but with your spirit, you worship. With your spirit, you perceive. And we're going to talk about intuition in a minute. With your spirit, you bear witness. With your spirit, you discern, you sing. See, a lot of what we were doing in worship day was singing in the spirit. With your worship, you bless. Your spirit, can, your spirit can be troubled, provoked, or aware. Your, your spirit has thoughts. Your spirit has the ability to know things apart from any outside information or influence. That's what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Your spirit has that ability. Jesus referred to your spirit as the innermost part of you. From his innermost being will flow in rivers of living water, and Paul called your spirit the inner man. So it's that innermost part of you, that invisible innermost part of you, that is the most important part of you. And if you don't have a revelation of that, I just highly recommend that you uh, spend some time in prayer asking the Lord to show you. Let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's going to be a really key passage of scripture as we go through this class, but 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 2, talking about the Spirit. Verse 14, 
But a natural man, that, that word in the Greek actually means the soulish man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. So what Paul is saying here is that your spirit has the ability to discern all things. Your ability, your, your spirit, and Watchman Nee said the spirit has, if you've ever read The, the Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee, it's an incredible book. It's like, like 600 pages, though. I mean, not in small font. I mean, it's a hard book to read, but it's an awesome book. Changed my life. But in that book, Watchman Nee said there's three functions of your spirit. There is intuition, there is communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and there is your conscience. Now, intuition, so, so what, what I found is this. If, if you want to learn, learn how to grow in and cultivate living from your spirit, you've got to learn to understand how the, the way that, that God designed your human spirit to function. Just like, just like you would not eat food with your soul, you would eat with your body, you, you know, just like your, your spirit was uniquely designed by the Lord to be his habitation, to commune with him, to hear him. And so developing these muscles that are in you, in your spirit, of learning to live by what Watchman E called intuition, I think it's a great, a great way to describe it. Intuition is a deep knowing within you. I don't know, you've probably experienced this before where you just know something so deep. Raise your hand, just raise your hand if you've just... You've known something so deep, deep in that you know, okay, this has to be, the, you, you found out later, this was the Lord. You, you knew this was the Lord. Well, that is your spirit's intuition, and that's the Holy Spirit speaking directly to your spirit's intuition to where you know something immediately apart from conscious reasoning or any outside information. Now, that's not meant to be just a one-time thing. That's meant to be how we live. We're meant to live by intuition. Now, again, that, now don't get me wrong. This doesn't mean like, okay, you can't brush your teeth until you intuitively know God is saying you need to brush your teeth, okay? But more and more, we are meant to live by developing this thing, our spirit and our intuitive ability to know something apart from conscious reasoning, mental processing, or feelings. And, and the, what I've found is, the more your spirit grows stronger, the stronger your spirit becomes, the more you recognize intuition. And so a lot of times people go, okay, give me the three steps to growing an intuition. And I would say, no, that's actually the wrong question. The right question is, let God strengthen your human spirit by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let Christ strengthen your spirit by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then your in intuition will naturally become aware to you. You'll, you'll naturally become aware, oh, this knowing deep in, that's my intuition. And it's because your spirit is growing stronger than your soul or your body. So the, the part of your spirit, the intuition is that part of your spirit that senses things at a deeper level than your physical senses. Um, it's not aided by the mind, the will, and the emotions. But here's the thing. All the revelation and the leading and the direction and the voice of the Holy Spirit does not go to your mind. It goes to, and does not go to your emotions. It goes to your, your, your spirit where he's grafted to, spirit to spirit. And then, and this all happens in an instant, but just if you put it in a slow motion, the, the Holy Spirit grafted to your human spirit communicates spirit to spirit by your intuition to where you know things, and then those spiritual thoughts are then communicated upward from your heart to your soul, and then your mind knows these spiritual thoughts giving you spiritual understanding. Does that make sense? Communion. The Lord said in John 4.24 is that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit. In other words, you can't, just like you can't eat food with your soul, you can't worship God except with your human spirit. It's the only way you can worship God. Now, 
the overflow of that comes with hands raised and emotions feeling and mind processing. Obviously, we've all felt the, the Lord in our emotions and the Lord in our mind and all that, but it, but it begins in a spirit-to-spirit -spirit way. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit. So communion, I would also add communion. Those who, if you want to commune with the Lord, if you want to grow deeper in your relationship with the Lord, if you want to know the Lord in a much greater way, we're called to know the Lord. Eternal life is not just a place where you go. Eternal life is a person you know. If you want that reality of communion with Christ, you've got to learn how to develop that by spiritual, to spiritual, spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion with the Lord. Conscience. The conscience is part of the, of the spirit as well. The conscience that is kind of like the compass that knows, okay, this is right, this is wrong. This is the Lord, this is not the Lord. This is a spirit, this is not the spirit. This is a spirit, this is a soul. Uh, the conscience, that, that deep conviction you feel is so important to, uh, to remaining in that place of obedience with the Lord where you just feel like, okay, you know, for some reason I just don't feel like I'm supposed to say that. For some reason I don't feel like I'm supposed to do that. That's your conscience in your spirit working with that intuition where you just know, okay, I just know deep inside of me I'm not supposed to do this. Or I just know deep inside of me I'm supposed to do this. That's your spirit's conscience, that, that deep part of conviction leading you and, and following that. So that is your spirit. So I would highly recommend if you are unfamiliar, if all this is kind of like, okay, I don't know a lot about this, I would highly recommend just getting before the Lord praying through, okay, Lord, teach me how to grow in my ability to recognize and discern my spirit. Because if you, if you only have mental understanding of your spirit, you can't really live from your spirit. And if you can't live from your spirit, you're going to be soulish and carnal. And if you're going to be, if you're soulish and carnal, you're not going to be made ready as a bride for Jesus. You're not going to become that mature son of God we've talked about. So it's really, really important. I can't stress this enough. If you, don't, if you only have mental understanding of your spirit, if, you're, if you feel like, okay, I, I feel like I'm an immature kid at this. I don't even, I, I know what you're saying is right, but I feel like for me personally, I'm just like this immature kid that I just can't progress beyond that. If you feel that way, I would highly recommend spend some time with the Lord asking him to teach you about your human spirit. It's so important. Okay, now your soul probably don't need to go as, as deep into understanding your soul, but, you know, your soul contains your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your soul has intellect, rational thought, wisdom, knowledge, reasoning. Your soul has ideals, preferences, aversions, passions, feelings, and affections. So, you, you know, a lot of us, we, we know about the soul. We have the power to make decisions. We have the power to reason, determine a course of action. Uh, the three components of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, they work together to form your personality and the, what makes you you, what makes you unique. Um, and so when God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, when God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, that self-life was awakened within Adam. He didn't yet have divine life in him. He had suke, soul life. That's the Greek word for the soul. He had suke soul life. He had uh, the soul life that animated, that he lived by, self-life in the soul. And so all humanity after him had that self-life. That's the natural way the soul operates, is that suke life. And until the Spirit of God comes in you and overpowers that soul life, every person will live by soul life. Every person will live by self-life in their soul. And so that's what makes you carnal, uh, or, or uh, soulish. So going through the Old Testament, if you, if, you if you take the Old Testament, you take a concordance and you look up the word soul, you're going to find that the, the word soul is mentioned uh, numbers of times in the Old Testament. This word, this, this Hebrew word, nepesh, it means the living being, the, the life, the self, the, pers the self life of a person, the appetite, the mind, the emotion, and the passion. And you can just, you know, I would encourage you, I won't go through it right now, but you can go through the notes and you can go through the book that's coming out, is if you search through the Old Testament, you can see the, the soul loves and hates and despairs and obeys, the soul can grieve, rejoice. Again, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail there. The New Testament, you flip over to the New Testament, the word for soul is suke, 
And that, and suke and, and nepesh in the Old Testament are basically synonyms. In, in fact, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, the word that's translated nepesh in the Old Testament is, is, is translated suke in the Greek. So they're the same word to give you that idea. And so that soul is, is really what makes you you. Now, what I want to really hit at here is I want you to see, this is very important. So I want you to see this because self-life is in your soul. And it's that self-life that is the real problem. Your real problem is not the devil. <laughs> the devil will use self-life in the soul. The real problem is you. It's me. It's this self-life in the soul that wants to live its life, that wants to have its way, that wants to do what it wants. That self-life in the soul, that self-life in the soul, unless it's crucified, unless it's dealt with, will suppress the life of Jesus in your spirit. So turn in, your, in the Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. I want you to see this because it's real, this is really important. This is something we're going to build upon. But I want you to see this with your eyes about the, the way Scripture uses soul and self-life and the way it uses it inter interchangeably. The Lord said in Matthew 26... Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Now, what's interesting, that word soul is suke. What's interesting in Luke 9.25, and you can flip over there as well, that Luke actually quotes the exact same statement the Lord made, but he uses a different Greek word. It's, it's really interesting and it's very important. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So I want you to catch suke, soul life, and self are one and the same. Self life resides in the soul. Self life is me getting what I want to get when I want to get it and how I want to get it done. That's the self-life. That's the life of the soul. That is the life that you naturally live by. That's the life that everyone naturally lives by. No, I would say 95% of humanity. There's probably like 5%. I, that's not an accurate number, but there's probably like 5% of the world's population that don't live by suke self-life. And that would be the spirit-led sons of God. And that, that, is probably, that number is probably really high. It's probably like 1%, if even that, maybe less than 1%, because not a lot of Christians are living from the spirit of God in them. They're living from self-life in the soul. And so what the Lord wants to do is he wants to bring the, the work of the cross into self-life in the soul to put self-life to death that Christ in you could live. And so the reason we're going into so much detail here is I'm not trying to bore you. I'm trying to help you understand. If you don't understand the way God created you, you're going to, by default, be soulish and carnal. Okay, the next thing we need to look at here is your heart. And a lot of people, don't, a lot of people get really confused about the heart. They think, okay, well, the heart is a synonym for the soul, or the heart is a synonym for the spirit. But they don't understand. That's not really what, what, what Scripture uh, uh, reveals. The heart is distinct. And the heart is the deepest place of your soul. The heart is the place of this channel that, that serves as the connection between your spirit and your soul. See, if you want to live by the spirit, then your heart has to be Filled with the Spirit. Your soul is not going to be permeated with the Spirit until your heart is permeated with the Spirit. Until your heart is filled with the Spirit. That's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. It's not automatic. If self is living then self is going to occupy your heart and whoever occupies your heart is going to be the life source that you live by. Just like the natural heart 
pumps blood to the rest of your body. Your spiritual heart pumps whatever life source you're living from into the rest of your body, into your soul, into your thinking, into your emotions, into your choices. And so if, if we don't understand the heart and Christ possessing the heart, then we're going to naturally live from self-life in the soul. Whoever lives in your heart, whoever occupies your heart, whoever is enthroned in your heart is going to be the life source you live by, whether of self or whether of Christ. So that's why Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence because out of your heart flow the issues of life. Everything you are is, a, is based on who you are in your heart. You cannot deny who you are in your heart. You cannot suppress who you are in your heart. Who you are in your heart is eventually going to come out one way or another. And if self is living in your heart as the primary life source, then Christ is not living. He's suppressed in you, even though you're born again, even though you have an incredible treasure inside of you, even though Christ in you is glory and rivers of living water and power and resurrection life and all that he is. If you're living and your heart is filled with self, what's going to come out of you is self-life. And Jesus talked about this. He said that from the, Matthew 15, verse 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. All the issues of life, whether righteous or unrighteous, flow out of the heart. And until Christ conquers the heart, we will never be who God wants us to be. We will never live the life God calls us to live. We will never produce the fruit God calls us to produce. We will never be the bride that Christ is looking for. We will never be those sons the Father longs for. Because the, the heart is the spring of life. It's the source of life. It's the deepest part of your soul. As the heart is, so are you. And so you cannot fake the condition of your heart. You cannot suppress the condition of your heart. Your heart is the real you. The heart, your heart is who you really are. And until Christ comes and fills the heart and possesses the heart and permeates the heart and dwells in the heart, you can never live by the Spirit of God. You can never live by the Spirit of life. So here's the question. Or actually, not the question. I want to say it like this. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Okay. It is now officially 12 o'clock, and I can sense there's this. Okay, so my dog has this internal clock. At 6 a.m., he realizes it's time to eat. So he starts scratching the paw, his paws on furniture, on me, on anything, saying, okay, feed me, feed me, feed me. At 6 p.m., his inter internal clock goes off. Feed me, feed me, feed me. Starts scratching everything. I can sense your internal clock is going off because we just got over 12 and you're like, hey, this should be over, okay? Just hang in there for a bit, okay? This is important, okay? Your internal clock is saying, okay, we should be getting close, we should be going. Hang in there, please, okay? Okay, amen, amen. Thank you. I'm glad there's one. Okay, your internal clock may be saying it's time for this to be over, okay? This is important, okay? This is very, very important. Hebrews 4.12 Hebrews 4.12, let's turn there. I want you to see this. It's a, it's, a, it's a familiar passage of Scripture, but I want you to see this. For the Word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul. I want you to notice that word is suke in the Greek, and spirit. Numa in the Greek, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, cardia in the Greek. A lot of times people get very confused thinking that the heart, the soul, and the spirit are the same. But this scripture verse tells us, though there's similarities there, there's also distinctions. And so understanding these distinctions the Holy Spirit wants to divide these distinctions, divide the soul from the spirit, 
divide the soul from the spirit so you can see, oh, this part of me is the soul. This part of me is the spirit. This part of me is the heart. Because here's, here's what makes living the abiding life so much easier is when you can dissect and you can break apart the different parts of you and they're not all intertwined together, it makes living by the indwelling life of Christ so much easier, so much easier. The mystery that surrounds it is solved so quickly when you understand, okay, oh, the, the Lord is dividing my spirit. The Lord is dividing my soul. The Lord is dividing my heart. Oh, this is what it is. And this is the way I think about it, is my spirit. If you want to know how this is an easy way to make a distinction between your spirit, your soul, and your heart, when you, and there is all based on thoughts, when you, uh, to, to distinguish your spirit is think of, is, is just realize those thoughts that are come by intuition, where you just know things. You, you just know things. You just know that this is what the Lord is speaking, or you know this is what this scripture verse is saying, or you know what God is saying you t for you to do. That, that, that intuitive knowing is the thoughts that come from your spirit. The heart are, you, you can think of the heart as the thoughts that come from deep desires, you know, deep beliefs, Deep ambition, you know, those, those deep um, desires and ambition and intentions and goals, that those, those thoughts that come from deep desires, I want to get married or I, I want my team to win this game, that's coming from your heart. Your soul is the part of you that processes it and says, okay, well, for this to happen, I need to do this, this, and this. That, calculate, that calculation, that reasoning, that deduction, that's your soul. And so understanding those those three different parts of you helps you understand, okay, the heart and the soul are different. The heart and the spirit are different. And for me to live the indwelling life of Christ, I need the spirit to fill and permeate my heart. That makes sense? So I'm, I'm going to skip over the, the uh, one section of notes you can, just for the sake of time, but you can go into, into it. But the way I think about it like this is just to, just to give you a couple examples between the difference between the heart and the soul. The heart says, I hope my team wins the championship game. The soul says, for my team to win the championship game, they need to block better, play physical, and run these plays. So the heart has hope and desires and ambitions and aspirations. The soul kind of figures out, okay, for that to happen, this is what needs to happen. That analytical part is the soul. The heart says, I have a deep desire to get married. The soul says, well, I need to come to Restoration Life Church because, man, they have an anointing. They are the hallmark channel of spirit-led, charismatic forerunner churches because if you come here, you're going to get married, okay? At least we had uh, five weddings in, from June to September. So, so, yeah, we're going to start putting that on our website. But the soul calculates all that. Actually, we're not. So that will wear us out if we keep going to all these weddings and showers. So... Anyway, but now baby showers, I guess, are going to come. So, but the soul calculates all that, okay? The soul says, okay, well, if I want to get married, I need to do this. And actually, the, the soul just needs to shut up and wait on the Lord. But the soul says, if I want to get married, I need to use a dating app or I need to ask a friend or I need to go where singles gather. I'm not saying the Lord won't lead you to do that. But the soul should be quiet if you really do want to get married. I think there are, I think this is even a word of knowledge. For some, that some want to get married and they're saying, their soul is saying, I need to do this, I need to do that. The soul just needs to be quiet and the soul needs to listen to the Holy Spirit inside your spirit and do what he says. And if he says, use a dating app. If he says, go here, go there, then do it. Otherwise, quiet your soul and wait on him. Okay, that's a prophetic word for someone. Okay, the, the heart says, I wonder what happens when you die. The soul says, well, if I want to figure out what happens when I die... I better search the scriptures. I better study and see what happens. See, the heart says, this, this might just be my heart, but the heart says, I need to be at church on time. Oh, man. Did I just say that out loud? Did, I'm sorry. Church starts at 10. Um, the heart says, I need to be at church on time. Okay, the soul says, to be at church at 945 I need to leave at 9.15 since it takes 30 minutes to get there. Okay, so maybe you're not living by your soul. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm going to get into trouble. 
sort of, kind of. Anyway, I threw that in there, so it's going to be in my book. So anyway, the soul says, my brother's looking in at me like, how much long are you going to preach for? He's out the window. Anyway, so the, the point here is this. The soul's intellect and will are mental functions. They work with the brain to process the emotions, desires, motives, and intentions which are pumped from the heart. So now I'm going to read a definition. Here's my definition of the heart. Just, just, we're going to show a slide here. The heart is the deepest part of the soul. Okay, so the heart and the soul is part of the soul. It's the deepest part of the soul. It's central to who you are and all that you do. It contains your deepest emotions, desires, beliefs, intentions, motives, thoughts, hopes, convictions, attitudes, affections, devotions, dispositions, and character. Most importantly, the heart determines your hunger, thirst, and desire for God. So that's the heart. And, and that, that heart must be conquered for you to live the spirit-led life. Okay, we're wrapping this up, okay? We're really, really close. Just bear with me. The body, okay, we're not going to go into the body too much. All I'm going to say about the body is the scriptures are, are, you know, when the scriptures talk of the body, they don't have a lot of really good things to say about the body, especially in the New Testament. Paul calls it a body of death, a body of sin and death. The law of sin is in the members of your body. Uh, the, the sinful work, uh, the, 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 work uh, the sinful passions, the uh, work in the members of your body to bear fruit for death. Nothing good dwells in my flesh. Uh, I mean, so, you know, the, the flesh is corrupted, lust and deceit. So the, the scriptures don't speak really great of your body. So, but when, when you get into the scriptures and you look at the scriptures, the, the New Testament uses the word flesh in one of two ways. Number one, the, the New Testament uses the word flesh to describe the lustful, sinful passions that are at work in your human body, which your human body is in the process of dying, okay? Just the truth. Your human body is in the process of dying, even when you're born. You know, the human body is already beginning the, the process of even growing, even dying, because that the, the human body is death is in the body. Okay, the, the scriptures also use the word uh, flesh to refer to the coupling together of the soul and the body. Okay, the soul and the body working together produce what Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, to produce the sins of the flesh. So when the body and the soul are coupled together, they produce the fruit of the flesh, which Paul details in Galatians 5. So that's what uh, the flesh means in Scripture. And the only remedy, the only remedy for your flesh is the cross of Jesus Christ. You cannot reform your flesh. You cannot make your flesh better. Your flesh has one solution, and that is to go to the cross of Jesus Christ and be utterly crucified with Christ. There is no other option. Your, your flesh is either going to be uh, either going to die in the death of Jesus Christ and on his cross and be crucified by the Holy Spirit, or your, or, your, or your flesh is going to be paid for in hell. So there is only one remedy for the flesh. The flesh, no matter how educated, no matter how moral it seems, no matter how good it seems, the flesh is inherently hostile to God, rebellious to God, and can never please God. There, you can ne if you live in the flesh, you can never, let this, let this sink in. If you live in the flesh, if you live in the soul, you can never, ever, ever please God. Ever. It's impossible. It's humanly impossible for you to please God in your flesh. Even if you're trying to live the Christian life. Even if you are trying to live the Christian life and live for God and you're doing it by the soul or by the flesh, you can never please God, ever. Only what is Christ can please God. Only what is Christ can please the Father. Only what he does in you and he does through you can please God. When we stand before the Lord, and we stand at his judgment seat, only what came out of this abiding life. Listen, this is why this is important. When you stand before the Lord, when I stand before the Lord, only what comes out of the abiding life 
What we did, what the fruit we produced, the works we produced that came out of indwelling life and living by indwelling life is going to survive the fiery judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Don't you think that's important? Does it, I mean, I don't want to stand before the Lord and have my works burned up because I did them from selfish ambition, self-life, self wanting to have its way, self having its fingerprints on it. I want self crucified. I don't want to lose my rewards burned up by the fire because I did not learn how to live the abiding life. That's why it's important. So one last little warning here is beware of Gnosticism. Okay, even though the scriptures say that the body is, 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 the body is, a, is a body of death, the body has lust in it, the body is rebellious, we've got to be very aware that we don't think the body in and of itself is evil. Now, if you're familiar with Gnosticism, it was, I won't go into all the details more in the notes, but Gnosticism, first century false doctrine that said the only thing that's important about you is your spirit. Your body is not important. And that's not true. Your body is important. Your body is meant to have the life of Christ permeating into your body. God made the body. God wants to redeem the body. God wants to transform the body. God wants your body to have the life of Jesus Christ permeated with it in this life, even before you get a resurrection, resurrected body. So the body itself is not evil. The, the sin in the body is what's evil, not the body. Okay, so make sure you don't make the Gnostic mistake that was made in the first century. Okay, so... And with all of that said, I can feel everyone's internal clock saying, get it done, get it done, get it done. With all of that said, just go back to the diagram. We'll wrap it up with this diagram. Is your body is the outermost part of you. You know your body. You see yourself in, in the mirror. Your soul is the part of you that, the, the, so the body contains the soul. When the, when the body dies, the soul goes, goes into eternity. The soul contains the heart, the heart contains the spirit, and the Holy Spirit is one with your, with your human spirit. That is where your connection to Christ is, your spirit to spirit union with the Holy Spirit. And it's from that innermost part of you that life flows out of you as a branch so you can produce fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. Amen. 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 Let me pray. Father, I pray you would help these people who are starving and scratching their paws and wanting to get out. I'm kidding. Father, I do pray, Lord, that, Lord, in all reality, Lord, that you would capture our hearts, Lord. Lord, I'm asking you to do a deep work within us. Lord, teach us. Teach us how to live the abiding life. Just where you're at right now, if you're hungry for this, if you're really hungry, ask the Lord to teach you how to live his abiding life. Let this class be a tool, hopefully, but go to the Lord himself for him to teach you, him to show you, him to instruct you. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord. God, you are the best teacher. And I pray, Father, that you would teach us how to live the abiding life, how to live from the Spirit, that we would be able to understand the different parts of, of the way you've created us, spirit, heart, soul, body, that you might divide, like Hebrews 4.12 says, the division of soul and spirit, to divide the, the spirit, the soul, and the heart, Lord, we pray. Father, that, that truly we might be led by the Spirit of God. We might be the sons of God led by the Spirit of God. Lord, would you bring our heart into that place of full and absolute possession Lord, we want to be filled in our heart with the Holy Spirit, permeated that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Lord, we pray that just as the, nat the natural heart pumps out 
blood to the arteries and to the circulatory system, Lord, that, that the heart, our spiritual heart, might pump out the life of Christ into our mind, will, emotions, Lord. And that our bodies, Lord, would be an expression of the indwelling life of Christ, we pray. So, Lord, teach us, we ask, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just uh, one last note, and then we'll be done. Is in your notes, there are, there are application questions. I want to really encourage you to go through those. You can get the notes. There should be a link on our YouTube channel for this session. Uh, I, or even in Facebook, if you listen on Facebook, there should be a link. But I want to encourage you to, to get, to read these, these, the application of how you can implement this into your life. This, this, whole, this whole class is meant for you to learn how to do it and to actually do it. And so there's some application questions that I would really uh, take the time to go through, to pray through and to work through and to really... Um, figure out how to, or to pray, pray through how to do that. So amen. God bless you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us online and have a blessed week.